Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit comments or questions at any time during today's presentation by using the chat window located to the right of the slideshow presentation. Underneath the slideshow presentation, you'll also see a files window where you may download a PDF copy of today's presentation. Please also note we'll be showing a video during today's presentation, so make sure that your computer speakers are turned on and unmuted to hear the video's audio. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Ms. Jen Braun. Thanks, David. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special AHA team training webinar sponsored by Hillrom, entitled Prone Position for Severe ARDS. My name is Jen Braun with AHA Center for Health Innovation and the AHA Team Training Program. We're happy you joined us today uh, to hear from our fabulous speakers. Uh, but before I turn it over first, just a few uh, pieces of rules of engagement. So the audio for today can be accessed in one of two ways. You can listen through your phone. You'll have to dial in and enter the passcode that you see in the notes pod at the bottom of your screen. Or if you have a strong Wi-Fi connection, you can listen through the audio through your computer speakers. Um, all hyperlinks on the screen are active if you click on them. And then we will hold a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So like David said, feel free to enter your questions through the chat, um, and we will get to it at the end. So with that, uh, we have a lot to cover today, so I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Jessica. So Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jen. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so pleased to be presenting this webinar on prone position ventilation for severe ARDS, especially at this time when prone has been at the forefront of conversation during the COVID-19 pandemic. I first would like to thank Hilram and Dee Kumpar for inviting me to speak, Neil Wiggerman for his collaboration on this project, who will present just following me, and thank you to the American Hospital Association for hosting this webinar. So my name is Jessica Montanero. I am currently the Assistant Nursing Care Coordinator, which is a clinical leader, and a practicing critical care nurse in a 24-bed medical surgical trauma neurotrauma intensive care unit at Mount Sinai Morningside in Manhattan, New York. I am a nurse for 18 years, and my specialty over the last eight and a half years has been critical care. Currently, my role as ANCC focuses on clinical leadership. I have also held adjunct teaching positions at various institutions, and currently am an adjunct lecturer for Hunter College here in New York City. Here, I have focused on practices help nurses deliver the highest quality of care uh, to patients and their units as a team. Throughout my projects, which have included many policy developments for critical care practice, integrating interdisciplinary collaboration with disciplines such as physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, and more has really played a major role in what I do. Teamwork is absolutely essential in today's healthcare environment. And that was never more apparent than during the COVID pandemic here in New York City, uh, really demonstrated in my hospital where day in and day out, we really functioned as one unit uh, and as a team that stepped up to care for these critically ill patients. You know, not separately as a nurse and then a doctor or a respiratory therapist, but together. And we really would not have made it without being a team component. So as we move through this webinar today, I will show you how and why a really strong foundation of interdisciplinary teamwork is vitally important, especially when it comes to proning the critically ill. I want to briefly share with you my ex uh, expertise with prone position ventilation. I was introduced to prone therapy for severe ARDS several years ago, and since then I was part of a small team who helped to develop a very robust protocol for manual proning of mechanically ventilated ARDS patients with great success. You know, proning can be carried out either manually using the physical labor of staff or with a specialized automated device such as a proning bed. And the information I'm gonna really focus on today will be manual prone positioning. I'm gonna touch on our original protocol that we developed uh, pre-COVID and review the modifications to our policy that were required uh, really for us to meet the demands and challenges that we faced during the pandemic. Uh, lastly, I've written two manuscripts on this topic, 
uh, one expected to be published soon with the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, AACN. And I have spoken quite a bit both locally here in New York City at various events and nationally for the AACN on proning. I'm very excited to share this information with you today. And it's important to note that our hospital, Mount Sinai and Morningside, was in the epicenter of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we received a vast number of patients in mild to severe ARDS who required prone position ventilation for survival. So just some housekeeping, I have no financial disclosures to report. I am also not endorsing any specific products for the use of proning. The information I will review today are my own personal opinions and views based off work that I have completed and my experiences in the clinical environment. Upon completion of this webinar, viewers should be able to identify ARDS specific pathophysiology, articulate how prone works and its benefits for ARDS. Uh, you know, quickly I'll say, as much as we will discuss in depth our prone protocol and its modifications, I have found over the years of my work that many uh, clinicians, nurses, even respiratory therapists uh, using prone did not fully understand ARDS or how prone worked as a therapy. And really having that component down is vital, not only for buy-in, but to aid in clinical decision making. Uh, we will next recognize components necessary for a prone protocol and finally outline proning modifications that were required during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, which can be used in a state of crisis. You know, I personally feel compelled to share this information because when, when COVID hit New York City and as other states were preparing for a wave and a surge of patients, nurses from various hospitals across the country were reaching out to me to get our prone position uh, policy and protocol they had either attended my session with AACN in 2019 on our hospital's development of our policy, or they had access to that session as a member of AACN. And really just knowing what we were going through in my ICU, I couldn't imagine being in a position of having to create a protocol to carry out prone maneuver uh, of intensely critically ill patients who in many cases were intubated and at times hemodynamically unstable. So, of course, we eagerly shared this information, uh, and I'm, I'm so extremely grateful for the work that our team in our ICU had done in 2018 that really put us in a position of advantage to meet these challenges of COVID. And it's my great hope that you will be able to take any part of what we develop and make it uh, really work for your team and institution so that you too can be prepared. So I'm going to work off the assumption here that if you have signed up for this webinar, you have some experience with ARDS. And so therefore, I will only provide a brief review of ARDS to also help drive home why proning works. Proning, of course, is a treatment therapy used for ARDS. Um, ARDS, also referred to as ARDS, and I do use those interchangeably, is an acute diffuse inflammatory lung injury which pre-COVID and still now uh, is really one of the most challenging clinical conditions to manage in critical care. ARDS is characterized by a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, bilateral opacities on chest imaging, and hypoxemia, which is refractory to oxygen therapy. ARDS continues to carry a high mortality rate, somewhere between 40 and 60%, uh, really depending on the severity of the disease state. And it's not ARDS is not a primary diagnosis, right? It's rather, it's a secondary disease process that results from a direct or indirect lung insult. So things like gastric aspiration, near drowning, uh, different types of pneumonias are types of direct lung injuries. And then we have sepsis, which is actually the leading cause of ARDS, acute pancreatitis, and various chest traumas. Uh, those are examples of indirect lung injuries that cause ARDS. So why is ARDS so challenging? Well, because it's unresponsive to conventional treatments like supplemental oxygen and mechanical ventilation. So as many of you may have experienced in your own clinical environment, a vast majority of patients diagnosed with COVID-19 presented with ARDS complications and quite acutely decompensated, uh, sometimes within or less than 24 hours of admission. And personally, just witnessing not just the acuity 
uh, and the rapid progression of decompensation, but just the sheer number of patients presenting in the same way, profoundly sick, diagnosed with COVID, you know, it was just a bit incomprehensible uh, for me and uh, and our team uh, as we were living it. So let's talk about standard care treatments used for ARDS, and those are low tidal uh, volume ventilation on the ventilator as well as PEEP. And literature has also shown us that early identification of ARDS and early intervention is really key for survival. Uh, ARDS typically requires the use of things called salvage therapies, things like sedatives, paralytics, continued inhaled vasodilators. Uh, they're called salvage or rescue therapies because really they're measures beyond ventilator strategies. Uh, we employ them with the goal to increase lung compliance on the ventilator and hopefully maintain oxygen saturations to the high 80s, low 90s. It's very common to see ARDS patients on high ventilator settings with oxygen settings, which we call FiO2, of about 90 up to 100%. And oxygen saturation levels uh, really just hovering in the, the low 80s with no improvement to gas exchange. And this was especially true with the majority of COVID patients that we saw in ICU. You know, I just say that treating ARDS is terribly frustrating for clinicians because essentially your toolbox is empty. I mean, what do you give a patient who is on 100% of oxygen mechanically ventilated, continuous inhaled vasodilators, specialized vent settings, and they continue to saturate in the 70s. Um, you know, and of course, then there's proning. And proning is a management for ARDS, which we're obviously going to talk about more in depth moving forward. I would like to note that proning was used as a frontline treatment prior to COVID in our ICU for severe ARDS. Uh, for all, and as well as for all of our COVID-19 patients who were diagnosed with ARDS. And while this discussion is proning of mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS, we also utilize self-proning on patients with COVID who were not intubated as an early intervention. So chest X-ray and PF ratios, often arterial blood gas, are primary diagnostic tools used to help determine ARDS and uh, its severity. A hallmark sign of ARDS is diffuse bilateral infiltrates on chest film and refractory hypoxemia, which is sustained inadequate arterial oxygenation levels, uh, oxygen levels rather, despite optimal levels of inspired oxygen. So let's just take a look at these films here. On the left is a normal chest X-ray, and you can see the black, right? And that's good aeration of the lungs. And on the right is a chest X-ray of an ARDS patient with diffuse bilateral opacities, uh, essentially non-cardiogenic shock, pulmonary edema. And if you follow the yellow arrows, they really outline a normal cardiac silhouette and normal borders of the diaphragm. And that's what we look for when we suspect ARDS in critically ill patients. So let's quickly review here the Berlin defining criteria for ARDS. Uh, this is a widely used tool to diagnose ARDS severity. It's been accepted nationally and was published back in 2013. So according to this, ARDS is considered acute. So timing really has to be within one week of that known insult. And we can see progression to ARDS as early as 24 hours or less uh, of that insult. And that was the scenario for many of the COVID-19 patients in our ICU during the height of the pandemic. Uh, next, bilateral opacities on chest imaging, so either chest X-ray or CAT scan, have to be consistent with pulmonary edema. And this edema, again, is not as explained by cardiac failure. And then you have severity, which is really determined by oxygenation using the P to F ratio, right? So that's the arterial oxygen, which is the partial pressure, PAO2, of a blood gas, divided by the fractured inspired oxygen, which is FiO2. And normal P to F ratios uh, should be greater than 400. Mild is considered 2 to 300. Moderate, 100 to 200. And then severe would be less than 100. 
uh, mortality naturally increases with increasing severity. And this classification system has been a good predictor of outcomes uh, in terms of severity and disease and ventilator-free days. Okay, so while proning is currently very much right now at the forefront of conversation as a mainstream therapy, which has been effective for the COVID-19 pneumonia, you know, prone position ventilation is not a new concept. We've been using this for a long time. Uh, prone was first reported uh, in relation to acute hypoxia uh, in the 1970s. So then over the next 40 years, prone will go on to be studied extensively. And while prone position was confirmed to improve arterial oxygenation and ventilation, there was not a lot of focus on outcomes or mortality uh, as a result of this improvement until 2013 when the Proceva trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, showing a mortality benefit in patients who were prone with severe ARDS. That's when the conversation around proning really began to shift. Uh, so let's briefly just talk about this study and why it's significant, because the more we understand the why, the more buy-in that we get. And the Proceva study was a randomized trial of 466 patients with ARDS in intensive care units across Europe uh, and demonstrated that with early application of prone in severely hypoxic patients with ARDS, and this trial used a PF ratio of less than 150, Patients who were prone and remained prone for 16 hours at a time, um, the Perceva group demonstrated a significant mortality benefit and uh, a longer ventilator free days. The trial, in addition uh, to proning, incorporated low tidal volume ventilation and therapeutic paralysis. So at 20, uh, 28-day mortality was 16% for the prone group versus 30% who remain supine. And 90-day mortality was 23% for the prone group versus 40% supine. So considering this was like the first ever study that demonstrated an absolute survival benefit, uh, prone became highly recommended as a frontline treatment with early application, uh, more so than a salvage or rescue therapy. So how does prone work? Like, what are we all talking about here, right? Uh, prone decreases the uh, transpulmonary pressures of the lungs. It really allows for more dorsal alveoli recruitment, therefore more even redistribution of gas and perfusion. It improves respiratory mechanics, it increases lung volumes, and it promotes drainage of secretion. So in the supine or backline position, the dorsal lung tissue, which is the backside of the lungs, really is susceptible uh, to compression under very normal conditions by things like the heart and other abdominal viscera in the thoracic cavity, even by something called shape mismatching because the lungs do not lie equally in the chest wall. Pressures from lung tissue, the heart and the diaphragm with respect to gravitational forces tend to pull fluid downward in the supine position, adding more pressure to the backside of the lung. And this also then contributes to the higher dorsal pressures. Uh, you can see this pictured on the top image of your screen here. So now imagine in ARDS, this is all exacerbated, right? The damage alveoli as a result of things like capillary leakage and intense alveoli flooding really impair gas exchange causing a VQ or ventilation perfusion mismatch. And the now fluid overloaded lung, uh, this tissue is much heavier, uh, further increasing the normal high dorsal pressures compared to the ventral or front side pleural pressures. Uh, again, this is all in the supine position. So in this case, the ventral alveoli become much more overinflated and the dorsal alveoli become further compressed. So the prone or the face down position as pictured on the bottom image really flips this whole picture, uh, allowing for less difference between the dorsal and ventral transpulmonary pressures. Prone, prone rather causes fluid to shift ventrally, right? It places less pressure on dorsal alveoli uh, prone shifts the weight of the heart to the sternum uh, and other abdominal organs ventrally, really allowing for 
dorsal alveoli recruitment, therefore more distribution of lung tissue and gas, resulting in more homogeneous oxygenation. I would like to say, you know, it's, it's truly amazing to see prone in action. And aside from understanding the pathophysiology of how this works, I personally have proned a number of patients who have had an immediate spike in oxygen saturation and an improvement to that PF ratio that really allowed us as clinicians to eventually adjust the ventilator setting, starting with the um, FiO2. So this, what we're looking at here, is an ultrasound, uh, ultrasound image of a trauma patient who developed ARDS. And on the left, you can see the dense consolidations associated with an atelectic lung. Uh, both of these images are reflecting a posterior view. This image was taken at the start of prone therapy. And the image on the right of your screen was taken 16 hours post-proning. And here, you're going to see much less consolidation, more aeration of the lung tissue. Uh, to me, this is just a very dramatic uh, image showing improvement from prone physician therapy. So just to quickly recap, we've reviewed pathophysiology of ARDS, the benefits of proning, how prone works, um, some imaging. And now let's really explore the next question. Are we using prone position as a therapy. And pre-COVID literature suggests that prone was vastly underutilized, right? So there was a lung safe uh, study. It was a large observational study from 2016 that looked at 459 ICUs in 50 countries. And what they found was that ARDS was largely under-recognized and under-treated, uh, still carrying those high mortality rates. There was a publication also in the Journal of Intensive Care that addressed the specific question about why we're not using it. And Shurtoff here really cited the following as being barriers for use. So things like cumbersomeness, difficult to initiate, uh, burden to maintain, fear of complications, and those relate to most likely loss of airway, vital intravenous access. Uh, and the need for additional human resources, because for prone to be safely carried out, you really need a skilled staff uh, to be trained. Um, you know, and these were actually the very reasons that our institution set out to create a stepwise process for proning to alleviate and mitigate these risks of adverse outcomes. So first, before I get into this picture, I want to give credit to our medical director, Dr. Janet Shapiro, who is always so forward-thinking and proactive. Uh, she was so instrumental in getting our project off the ground. Uh, she created an interdisciplinary work group of nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists. Uh, and you know, from there, we conducted a literature review of best practices U using mainly the Proceva trial. Um, as our guide. We used in situ simulation, creating that real world environment to test the protocol as we developed each step. And this really helped us rapidly develop the protocol. I'd like to highlight in the photo here the interdisciplinary staff that is at the bedside. You see a physician, uh, many nurses, two respiratory therapists. And we found that the interdisciplinary component really to be the foundation and the strength of the protocol and its success. Uh, the patient you see there, well, we used a live ICU clinician uh, as the patient in place of a mannequin for our in situ simulations and protocol development. And this provided us uh, real-time feedback and the ability to adjust protocol steps on the spot. So for example, we found that when we were initiating the prone turn, we were not pulling this mock patient far enough laterally off the bed to complete the prone. Uh, we would have to stop and reset. And I'm not sure that we would have recognized this if we were using a mannequin. Um, and I certainly know that we did not want to find this out in a real event. The experience of using uh, human body weight was an was tr truly invaluable, rather, to this process. 
Um, I'll note that actually the mock patient here was one of our ICU fellows who is now in attending and who graciously volunteered his services. Um, he would stop us in the middle of the procedure and provide feedback about what positions hurt and so on. So for example, uh, we learned here that too much reverse Trendelenburg of 30 degrees, which is standard practice in ICU uh, to maintain the head of the bed, was not working. So we adjusted our protocol to call for only a slight reverse Trendelenburg once in the prone position of about 10 to 15 degrees. Uh, additionally, not taking the patient out of reverse Trendelenburg for, for uh, head repositioning was reported by him as uncomfortable. Uh, I also want to point out here that the nurse at the bottom right corner, uh, she is actively documenting what is working and what is not throughout this process. And then we would go back and adjust the protocol formally. And when the protocol was finalized, we then used a formal simulation uh, training in our sim lab uh, to train a larger group of interdisciplinary staff on this protocol for competency and for safety. This is a picture of our first and second in situ simulations. Uh, yes, I was actually able to get our ICU director to play a part of our, our mock patient. Uh, she's such a trooper. Um, but here, what we're focusing on is line protection and airway securement and management. Uh, again, just I want to note the collaboration of an interdisciplinary team participating, uh, you know, really which helped us not only uh, to develop the protocol, but to get buy-in about each discipline and their role and the importance of their role. You know, simulation is such a safe way to work through high-risk procedures by reducing harm to patients, allowing for mistakes while learning, um, and really not practicing, you know, with things like vital critical care access and artificial airways under stress and in a crisis. And I'll just have you know, I think we were really good at this because it looks like our patients are intubated, but they're not. Um, we did not intubate our mock patients. Uh, all lines and tubes were simulated. Okay. Uh, you know, also I just would like to mention here that simulation is extremely successful when the environment is set up from the get-go as a safe place to learn. Uh, our staff had communicated prior to our development uh, their concerns and their fear of carrying out this procedure uh, because many of our staff had never utilized uh, manual proning before. So this was just another factor that geared us toward using simulation as a development and training platform. So let's jump into the protocol here. and. Part of the protocol including, uh, included a nursing developed checklist. And this was broken down into categories. Again, uh, I have to say that the need for this was identified only as a result of our in situ simulations. And the categories included equipment needed, pre prone patient preparation, room setup, orders required. Uh, we even outlined a step-by-step -step walkthrough led by a nurse leader of the prone event for the actual turn. Um, and, you know, it was quite detailed. But remember, manual proning was still considered a very big event pre-COVID. Uh, there were a lot of steps that we needed to complete. And we found that really this was the best way not to miss any steps. We placed this uh, list, if you will, in a checkbox type list. Uh, and these were the responsibilities of the primary nurse. So, in fact, you know, pre-COVID, other institutions within our hospital system, and there are many, uh, and even with staff who had did not go through any kind of formal training sessions, utilized uh, PRONE with this checklist. And they were able to carry out our protocol in a systematic fashion without uh, any adverse outcomes. You know, I have to say we have, we've just learned so much through COVID and all of the prone and supine events. Honestly, we did not use this checklist. So as good as it was, it could not be used uh, due to the fact that uh, during COVID, the challenges and limitations that we faced would just not allow us to. So we really cut the steps of our original protocol down by half. Uh, 
due to time, I've highlighted some of the major portions of the checklist that we had no choice but to modify as a result. And we really did so successfully, which led us to look at modifying our original protocol and po uh, policy permanently. So categories such as the number of clinicians required at bedside to prone, the type of clinician required, uh, the use of therape therapeutic paralysis, and other salvage therapies such as um, you know, uh, sedation, and then placement of central and arterial access points. Uh, positioning of equipment during the actual prone event. These things were all adjusted. Uh, just to highlight some of the challenges that we faced that led to these uh, modifications. So we had limited staffing, either due to staff being out sick and on furlough, uh, not enough staff to meet the surge of admissions and emergent situations that were occurring. I'll note that uh, we did receive an influx of volunteer staff from outside states eventually. But the most intense period of COVID uh, lasted for about uh, beyond two months, but the, the crux of it was about two months. And I can easily say that during those two months, every 30 to 40 minutes, there were emergencies or codes really requiring the attention of critical care staff. Uh, there was rapid progression of patients to profound acute critical illness, uh, patients clinically changing within hours, large number of patients requiring proning or supination at one time. There was modified use of equipment. So for example, all of our IV pumps were placed outside of the ICU rooms. Um, there was limited and frequently changing medications and availability. And then just finally, this whole chaotic you know, environment that was a challenge. Okay, uh, so, um, Let's start with our most challenging hurdle, and this was staffing. Uh, so our original protocol was designed to have nine ICU clinicians to prone. There was a physician leader, a nurse leader, two respiratory therapists at the head, one to manage just the airway, the other for head repositioning, four turn nurses, uh, one nurse dedicated as a line nurse just to help to ensure there was no vital access dislodgement during the turn. Uh, these staff had all gone through formal SIM training or completed a yearly competency for training. Uh, during COVID, the, and you know, the staffing requirement for our original protocol was just not possible. So we eliminated right off the bat the physician and nurse leader and the line nurse. And after several rounds of staffing modifications, we eventually even eliminated the need for respiratory therapy altogether. And this was just due to their own limited staffing in their department and their need to be present at emergencies elsewhere. So the final modification called for proning with one physician or a CRNA located at the head of the bed. Uh, really, it had to be someone that could reintubate the patient if the airway was lost. Uh, so this two-person position was now managed by one person, ensuring the airway was secure and control of head repositioning as one task. The next big modification uh, was that originally all of the staff who participated were trained on prone and were only ICU clinicians. Uh, so pre-COVID, this included respiratory therapists, ICU attendings, critical care nurses, and they were the only staff present for a prone event. And as more patients required proning during COVID, uh, and sometimes many in one shift and in succession, you know, there were a lot, we were just struggling to keep up. Uh, so at times, you know, a lot of the departments during this time uh, in our hospital had slowed due to not being able to carry out their typical duties. So the physical therapy department actually happened to be one of those units and they offered their services to the ICU. And here we had, you know, PT and OT therapists who were expertise in body mechanics and it just seemed ideal to use them uh, as assistance for proning. So unlike our original protocol, these were non-ICU clinicians, many of whom had never proned before. Uh, and a core group of PTOT members really joined our staff. They learned how to carry out the prone maneuver on, on the spot uh, in a real event. They did this several times and rather quickly, they became our prone team really replacing the nurses in that turn position. Uh, I would like to note, though, that the primary nurse of the patient was always involved in, you know, this event, 
uh, was responsible for patient and room preparation, and the charge nurse would step into this role if the primary nurse needed to actually, you know, uh, attend to their other patient. Uh, so, you know, in the beginning, I have to say that as the charge nurse, I was, uh, you know, sometimes proning with just a team of physicians myself uh, because no one was available to assist. Uh, but in the beginning also, it was required, and this was during COVID, that myself or uh, one of the members of the core prone work group was actually present to carry out a prone event. But as the team became stronger and the critical care staff became more comfortable, this need was altogether eliminated. And really the physician, the primary nurse, and the CRNA with that PTOT group was able to conduct prone on their own. The development of this non-critical care prone team really was essential for a few reasons. It allowed the critical care staff to attend to the constant stream of incoming patients and attend to the emergencies. Uh, and before this team was in place, you know, again, a great challenge for us to even uh, get them at the bedside to do this in a timely manner. And again, not because our protocol wasn't good, but just because of the intensity of the clinical care environment. Uh, so as a side note, you know, I would say that we were also very concerned about limiting unnecessary exposure to COVID staff. And so an unintended benefit of decreasing the number of staff required at the bedside was uh, that we were able to limit exposure. So equipment, uh, in terms of modifications here, our original protocol called for specific positioning of IV pumps. Uh, again, originally everything remained attached to the patient during proning. Uh, and you know this really dictated then which way the patient was pulled to initiate the prone event. So our first modification allowed for a disconnection of intravenous and arterial access points just for the duration of the turn and only when the team is in the ready position. So trust me, if you're listening, I know many of you might balk at that. I was nervous myself, um, but we were able to reduce the turn time down to a very short 10 seconds. Disconnection of these lines absolutely made it easier for management of the now multiple feet of extension tubing because our pumps were positioned outside the patient's room. And many patients were on multiple infusions uh, and prone now could be initiated whichever way was easiest for the staff or whichever way would really protect any femoral access points during the turn from dragging under the patient if they were present, therefore decreasing the risk of dislodgement. So uh, important to note that staff was specifically tasked with disconnection of lines when the team was in the ready position and quick reconnection once the prone turn was completed. So prior to the event, this was discussed. So post the event, there was no discussion about who would do what, and reconnection was seamless and could happen in a timely manner. Uh, next, as a result of frequent emergencies and limited staffing, our medical teams were not always to really place a central and arterial access in a timely manner. Uh, so our second modification here allowed for proning to occur with two large bore IVs, stages 20 or 18, and this was also dependent on the types of medications and rates that the patient were requiring. And a benefit here was that prone could occur on the spot and sometimes in urgent situations without delay. And trust me, there were certainly situations where patients were deteriorating rapidly and prone needed to happen immediately uh, just for survival. So not all patients diagnosed with COVID-19 and ARDS complications did require therapeutic paralysis. So we eliminated that as a requirement. Uh, patients who did require this um, actually, you know, as a salvage therapy, those medications were titrated for vent synchrony. Uh, and for those that we were concerned about either vent synchrony or not tolerating the actual turn, uh, we would use an IV push dose of, of, of a paralytic. But again, you know, they had to be deeply and properly sedated. Uh, and all of our patients requiring prone were sedated, and our institution uses the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale uh, scoring system. Uh, and then we added extra foam uh, protective pads to the anterior surface of the body and the chest because we were seeing an increase in pressure injuries, which I will just talk about in a minute. Uh, so major modifications for the term procedure itself 
really included eliminating a, a pause while the patient was in the upright lateral position uh, in the rotation, uh, which again, you know, uh, now that everything was disconnected, allowed us uh, much more freedom to decrease the prone turn. Uh, and just like the arterial and central, central line access points, uh, the team uh, discussed prior to, and this was designated who was going to reattach the ECG leads for a seamless and more timely reconnection, again, with that prone time down to 10 seconds. Um, and our original protocol called for initiating prone and or supine uh, based on the placement of these lines. And there was a lot of work that went into where all this placement uh, of position, uh, of, uh, rather equipment, was going to happen. Uh, and so the, it eliminated the need for that as well. Uh, so now what we did was uh, we worked on something called the nose nose. And this was meant to be whatever way the nose was pointing the, uh, or the head was positioned, uh, we would start to initiate the lateral turn uh, and start proning or supining in that direction. Uh, originally intended, this was only for emergency events, um, but really this just decreased the amount of time for discussion of which way to start, allowing for more much quicker prone and supining events. Um, and finally, I'll just mention here that we did re decrease all uh, head repositioning uh, at this point. Uh, and unfortunately, that is best practice and that is what is standard, but uh, that really requires a staff of about three to four to do. And due to our limitations of staffing, it was just not possible. So we addressed uh, pressure injury development with the use of a gel head positioner and protective foam pads. There's that picture that I talked about, the nose nose, and let's move on. Okay, so real quick, pre-COVID outcomes. Uh, post our original protocol, development, we had successfully utilized prone positioning ventilation for a number of critically ill patients with severe ARDS. We did not have adverse outcomes. Um, and I would say that we saw more effective communication uh, during proning. Core work group members observed, you know, nursing staff identifying ARDS much earlier and even sometimes, you know, suggesting prone as a therapy to the physicians. Uh, and we, we attribute this success really to its careful development and commitment to formal training of staff using a simulation environment. Uh, we estimate that we proned up to 250 times in a seven-week period, and I'm telling you that is a conservative number, uh, probably much higher. Sometimes there were seven prone events in one 12-hour shift. We had no loss of airway or critical access points, no cardiac arrest. And for patients that decompensated, really requiring emergency supination, those were carried out successfully as well. Uh, again, we did employ all safety practices as much as possible, but we came to realize that prone did not have to be this big, scary event that it, that it once was. Um, prone and supination can be carried out with much less extensive steps in place. And, you know, as an unintended consequence, this was also extended to departments that don't use prone as frequently, such as the cardiothoracic ICUs. The prone, uh, using a prone team taught us that we can train non-ICU clinicians to successfully employ this maneuver to turn patients, which again takes great burden off the critical care staff. And we plan on modifying our original protocol uh, to incorporate their department when needed. We did see an uptick in, in anterior surface pressure injuries. And while some of this may be related to, you know, uh, not being able to head reposition, other factors that may contribute were multiple proning events required for one patient over the course of several days, the patient's own pathophysiological conditions, such as poor tissue perfusion, hypotension, long-term use of high vasopressors, um, that really contributed to their pressure injury development. Uh, we are very pleased with the work around prone that our staff was able to accomplish in a time of crisis. Uh, you can see that we learned so much. And I just would like to tell you that, you know, prone doesn't have to be the scary event that it had to be. Preparation is key. Um, and again, using those non-ICU clinicians is essential. And there are various departments that could be willing to step in 
I do have reference slides uh, to these modifications, post this uh, presentation today. There is my contact information. I'd be happy to collaborate and answer any questions. And I would like just to quickly note that if anyone is interested in, a, in simulation, uh, Mount Sinai is having our annual Tri-State Regional Simulation Symposium on September 25th virtually. And we're really going to discuss creati creativity and strategies in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as well as stronger evidence that supports uh, really and transform simulation in the healthcare setting and some futuristic simulations to come. And with that, I would love to turn this over uh, to Neil to talk about methods of proning. All right. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks, everyone, for joining and for your interest. Um, I'm, uh, my name's Neil Wiggerman. Uh, I have a PhD in industrial engineering with a specialty in ergonomics. And uh, for disclosure, I'm an employee of Hillrom. Um, I work in R&D with uh, the engineers that design Hillrom's product and products, and we do uh, we publish research that addresses knowledge gaps in the field. But um, you know, the basic goal of ergonomics my, and my my area of study is to match the capabilities of the human to the work environment so that work can be performed safely and productively. Um, pruning is a good uh, example of a subject worthy of study from an ergonomic perspective because. As Jessica explained, here we have this life-saving therapy that's been underutilized, not for medical reasons, but because we don't have many tools to do it safely and easily. Um, these are just two videos that you can find on uh, the web that show uh, just what a production proning is. Getting seven ICU staff, um, Jessica's was cut down to five, but getting this many staff around the patient is a Herculean task before COVID. Um, and so for many hospitals right now, it's a good time to pause and examine the methods for proning, either to get a robust protocol off the ground or to uh, revise existing procedures. And just some of the comments I'm seeing in chat uh, reinforce that we're all still figuring out how to optimize the process. So perhaps the protocol was created very quickly in the midst of COVID, and there's an opportunity for refinement, or perhaps a facility that prone patients very rarely, like Jessica's is now finding their protocols not suitable or sustainable for more frequent use during COVID. So at Hillrom before COVID, we'd been periodically asked by customers if there were better solutions and uh, you know, some from marketing and R&D, we'd begun looking into this uh, for methods and opportunities. So we started by reviewing uh, what, was, what was out there and when COVID hit, we formalized this into uh, a, a literature review and, and a, a review that we uh, published recently in the German Human Factors, the journal Human Factors. Um, we paid the open access fee, so if you, if you follow this link, uh, you'll be able to download it without getting hit with a, a paywall. So just the next few slides will give a brief overview of that review. So we did an academic literature review. Uh, we performed an internet video search and also reviewed uh, our findings and, and rec recommendations with uh, an with experts that had a you know diverse backgrounds, but they all had experience in safe patient handling. Uh, as we looked at the um, uh, the different methods, we considered uh, in the evaluation patient safety, uh, staff safety, especially um, patient handling injury, staff required, and the equipment required, as well as patient uh, patient weight limit. So as, as you look at what's out there, uh, there's, there's three main categories um, of, of methods and, and different takes and, and variants of these different methods. Uh, the most common by far is manual proning, and Jessica described some details of what their facility was doing. Um, this can involve different equipment as well to assist. Uh, there are lift-assisted methods and uh, a, a proning bed. So to look at the patterns in these different methods, I'll get into some of the details of the, the physical movements. Um, you can see for the manual method, it typically consists of moving the patient laterally to the side of the bed. Sometimes the patient will hang over the edge of the bed, uh, then rotating the patient. Sometimes the sliding and the rotating happens at the same time, so these steps can be a bit interchangeable. Uh, and then finally, the patient is, of course, lowered to prone um, position manually. Uh, 
some of these variants use sliding sheets to make this first step more uh, easier. Uh, there's also a burrito technique, uh, informally called that because the patient's wrapped in a sheet with pillows uh, placed on the patient first so that when they're rotated to prone, the, you know, the positioners are, are in place. But, you know, you can see from this photo, um, depending on the size of the patient, it can require a lot of staff and it can be very uh, physically demanding. Uh, Lift-assisted techniques tend to involve uh, a similar process. They use a repositioning sheet to lift the patient and move them to the side of the bed. So this manual step is eliminated. They also then, one uh, side of the repositioning sheet can be disconnected and the lift raised to help turn the patient. The final step, though, is still manual. This screenshot from a video shows uh, that manual lowering, of course, there would still be more caregivers around uh, involved with this with this activity. So the proning bed is uh, something many of us are probably familiar with. This takes out the manual lifting after the patient's been transferred to the bed. Um, there's some limitations. The biggest for COVID was availability. There's just a finite number of these on the market, um, and so with COVID, uh, getting access was, was challenging. They're also expensive. Uh, they have a 350-pound weight limit, and alarms uh, will go off after a few hours for, to bring the patient back to supine for pressure injury reasons, which isn't compatible with a lot of the printing protocols. So, you know, if we look at the current methods, uh, one of the big limitations was still, even with the lift-assisted methods, the mechanical lowering. Um, and the number of staff required. Um, I saw some comments too in the chat about weight limit. There's a lot of uncertainty at what's possible. And the big question, especially for the biggest patients, is how can we give them the same care that we're giving for smaller patients? So with some of these uh, limitations, we went into our own lab uh, at Hillrom and, and looked at how we could try to address some of these and came up with a method that I'm just gonna add to the, uh, to the library of what's out there, and I'm gonna spend a few extra minutes on it just because it's new. Um, so, uh, you know, this method, it involves using two lift straps. These are just uh, very simple straps that are made by a lot of uh, vendors. They come in different widths and lengths. Um, but the, the method works by getting, putting these under the patient and off center, and um, they can, Basically, we want one end of the strap to be longer uh, and the other end to be shorter, and this causes the rotation of the patient. So the, the top of the upper strap goes between the shoulder and the, the armpit. The top of the um, lower strap hits at about the greater trochanter. I'm going to show, um, it, well, so here, here are the process steps. So it works similarly. Once the straps are connected, uh, the lift is raised. It causes the patient to rotate. Uh, the patient won't be fully lifted off the surface, but it'll be possible to slide them laterally, partially supported by the surface, the lift taking some of the weight, so it's a low, uh, low force pull. And then uh, when we lower the lift, it'll bring the patient down to flat. I'm gonna show, I have a two minute video uh, that uh, we're gonna bring up here, and, uh, and I'm just gonna dive in. is going the top of the strap is going to be approximately aligned with the trochanter. We are going to have uh, a short and a long slide on the multi straps. We're placing them off center which is going to cause the patient to rotate. So if we hold these up you can see one side is about at least 12 inches longer than the short end of the strap. So when we attach the straps to the lift, we're gonna attach the short end to the short loop and the long loop of the long end. This is gonna create further a, a difference in length between the two, two sides. So before turning the patient, we're gonna tuck the patient's hand under on the side toward which she's gonna turn. And we're gonna cross the leg over on the opposite side toward the side she's going to turn. When the team is ready, 
we're going to raise the lift and the patient will begin to turn. Once the patient has turned towards the side, we're going to pause just before the patient is lifted fully off the surface. So we have some support of the surface and the patient is easier to move to the opposite side of the bed. Now when we're ready, we're going to lower the patient. The nice thing about this method is we can pause at any point to place uh, pillows or positioners uh, and, and manage the lines and tubes of the patient. Okay, We're then going to disconnect go the, the, the loops of the straps. Thanks everyone for bearing with me on a video there, but I, I think the video, it just explains a lot more than what, what images can do. Um, we've talked to, um, uh, you know, and, and again, the thing to emphasize is that it can be done with three people, as few as three people anyway, because it takes the manual lifting out. Um, but regardless, I think, uh, you know, as Jessica said, what you ultimately try, it's important to have that interdisciplinary team involved um, and to be able to try things with actual humans uh, and, and, you know, discover what is going to work for your facility with the equipment that you have but to, or the equipment that you, you know, can have. But the, uh, the key things to consider are, I think, this mechanical lowering and how that's going to be performed how to minimize the number of staff, um, and the patient weight limits. And maybe there are different procedures for different patient weights. Um, but I hate to think of the, you know, the larger patients not being able to be, uh, being excluded from some of the life-saving procedures. And finally, um, thinking about uh, the, the risk of the, of the staff. So, you know, we, we, we already know that nurses and nurse assistants uh, receive some of the greatest rates of musculoskeletal injuries of any occupation, and most of that's driven by patient handling, uh, manual patient handling. And so especially as these practices become very common as they move from something that was done once in a blue moon to something that might be a pretty common practice, uh, this is an important thing to involve, uh, you know, the hospital ergonomics teams, risk managers, PTOTs, and the nurses themselves. Um, so I'm going to stop there so we at least have a time for a couple questions. But um, this is a, a list of some of the representative videos of these different methods. These appear in the journal article as well. Um, the link to the article is at the top of these resources at the bottom as well as some other resources like uh, NTIAP's pressure injury prevention tips for pruning. So thanks so much for, uh, for your attention and I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks, Neil. Really appreciate that. And thanks to Jessica for a fabulous presentation. Um, it was also very fascinating um, to see all the support in the chat and everyone's Q&As um, and just kind of chatting amongst yourselves and providing feedback to one another. So that was really wonderful. Um, so I think that actually since we're nearing the top of the hour, um, we might not have time for questions. Um, in that case, Neil and Jessica had shared their emails in the chat, uh, or rather in their presentation. So please turn your attention there and follow up uh, should you have any questions. Um, and I like to reiterate that this is being recorded and we will share with you the recording once it is available. We will send that to everyone via email. Uh, and we would also be happy to share um, any follow-up uh, that Neil and Jessica would like to provide us with. So with that, I would like to say thank you once again to our sponsor, Hillrom. We really appreciate uh, this webinar. And thank you to everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's presentation. You may disconnect your phone lines, log off your webinars, and thank you for joining us today.